This was something I shared on Channel News Asia FM 938 Live back in 2011. And if you think that this information is going to be outdated, think again. Hi, this is Alex Chua from Home of the Elites. And having been in the real estate business for the last 30 years, I have seen many mistakes that home sellers made. In this 10-part series, I will share with you the 10 most common mistakes that home sellers made. And not only that, I will share with you how you can avoid these mistakes. This was something I shared on Channel News Asia FM 938 Live back in 2011. And if you think that this information is going to be outdated, think again. The truth is, many home sellers are still making the same mistakes today. Before we get started, I would like you to click on the Follow Us button on our Facebook page and also hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Remember to turn on the notification so that you can be updated whenever we load new contents onto our channels. Okay, so if you are ready, let's get started with mistake number one. I can sell my own property without engaging a real estate salesperson. Let's call real estate salesperson RES in short. Yes, you are absolutely right. You can definitely sell your own property without engaging a RES. And there are just three things that you need to take note of. Firstly, you will need to possess market knowledge, which is critical. Then, you need to have the time. And finally, you will need to have certain skills to do it right. And I'm not just talking about negotiation skills, but others as well, which I will come to that in a while. Let's begin with market knowledge. As a home seller who is unrepresented and trying to sell your own property without engaging a RES, you will need to know what is happening in your neighbourhood. For some experienced RES who specialise within a particular estate or a certain types of property, they spend a lot of time keeping themselves up to date with the market. They know which are the units for sale, what has been sold or even how long a particular property is being marketed. They are on the ground every day and have a good feel of what is happening. All such information helps the RES negotiate better, regardless they are representing a home buyer or a seller. As a home seller who is unrepresented, you will need to know just as much so that you do not end up overpricing or underpricing your property. What about time? Do you have the time to run advertisements and handle all enquiries? You can expect more than 30 calls a day, with more than half of them from RES asking for permission to market your property. Don't be surprised when that happens. And after getting all the calls, you will have to coordinate the viewing appointments so that they do not clash with one another, followed by handling the negotiations which is a good thing if that happens. Finally, the paperwork. And that is assuming everything went through smoothly. Everything that I have just shared requires skills, regardless you are dealing with a direct buyer or a RES representing a buyer. For direct buyers, what would you do if a couple spends an hour viewing your property, asking you a lot of questions and showing strong interest but the minute they walk out of your door, you do not hear them anymore. Do you make the first call to follow up on them? Think about this for a moment. In a negotiation process, it is a known fact that whoever makes the first move to reach out to the other party loses the bargaining power. The prospect might be keen, but careful not to make the first move or initiate the first offer, but rather wait for the sellers to contact them. Tricky as it might seem, negotiation is not just about what is verbally communicated, but also a psychological mind game whereby our actions speak louder than our words. In this instance, having a RES to act as a cushion might be good for both parties, 
But the question is, who is the RES representing? You or the buyer? Negotiation process can be long and tedious, even dragging on for months, with neither the buyer nor the seller willing to give in. Without a RES, direct buyers may also expect sellers to sell the property to them at a lower price since the seller is saves on the commission. So, you might not really be saving your money after all. Remember I mentioned earlier that it's not just about negotiation skills. What other skills would you need? You will need to know how to write attractive ad copies to get prospective buyers excited even before viewing your property. You can have the most enticing ad copy, but if you fail to target the right audience, all your effort will be wasted, which is why knowing which platform to promote your property is just as important. And if you have some digital marketing skills, that will definitely help a lot as well. Home sellers, the next point that I'm going to share with you is very important. If you cannot remember everything in this video, this is the one point that you must remember. You must know how to create a demand for your property so that your prospects will not feel that he or she is the only buyer out there. You know the meaning of lowballers and you do not want to attract this group of people. Well, if all this seems too much for you, then you are better off engaging a RES to do the job for you. But I'm not saying you should engage any RES without doing your due diligence. It is true that all RES are in the business of consultation when it comes to buying, selling or leasing properties. While some may choose to specialise, others may prefer to do everything that comes along the way. So you will need to be very careful who you choose to work with. For landed properties and luxury real estate, an experienced RES who is also a specialist makes the difference. It has been proven that a specialist can negotiate and secure prices 5-10% to higher or even more compared to the last similar transaction in your neighbourhood. So, do your homework, talk to some of these RES to find out what they can do for you. Remember, always get the right person for the right job and it will make your life easier or even help you achieve a new benchmark for your property. You have two best friends. One of them is a heart surgeon and the other an eye specialist. But one day you have a bad toothache. Who would you go to? One of your two best friends or a dentist? Why? The answer is obvious, isn't it? But when it comes to selling their property, many home sellers make the mistake of appointing a friend or a relative as their real estate salesperson. This is not surprising given the fact that there are about 30,000 real estate salespeople in Singapore. So again, instead of saying real estate salespeople, I'm going to use RES for short, alright? When you are online, Google about the common mistakes that home sellers make and you will come across articles that emphasize the consequences for failing to fire a bad agent. But what happens if he or she is your friend or relative? Some of you may have experienced this and you know how easy it was to hire them and how difficult it was to fire them. I know someone who felt obliged to her brother-in-law who is a RES. She gave him the exclusive rights to sell their landed property. After more than a year without results, she felt frustrated because she was unable to upgrade to a larger landed property until her current place has been sold due to the additional buy stamp duties payable for second property. I remember the expression on her face when she mentioned the awkwardness of sitting together during the Chinese New Year reunion dinner at her mother-in-law's place. To make matters worse, landed property prices was on an upward trend, with prices going higher and higher with each and every transaction, which would have been great for someone who's downgrading. But it is bad news if that same person is trying to upgrade. And let me explain to you why. If we take a 10% price increment in landed transactions, the seller will gain an additional 600,000 
for the semi-D that they are trying to sell for $6 million, but they will also end up paying $1.2 million more for that bungalow that they are trying to buy for $12 million. And that, my friend, is a lot of money. Some home sellers chose not to go with friends or relatives for certain reasons which they have thought about beforehand. They may not feel comfortable sharing personal reasons for selling, or perhaps don't feel good that their friend or relatives know how much they profited from their sale. In my opinion, there is really nothing wrong to hire a friend or a relative to market your property if he or she can achieve the results you desire. But here are three things for you to consider. Number one, what are the chances that things will turn sour if your expectation is not met and you have to fire them subsequently? Number two, will your friend or relative become too pushy in the event that there is an offer which is below your expectation but he or she feels otherwise? And number three, do you value this friendship and would like to maintain a good relationship with them not only now, but in the future as well. If your answers are no to all the three questions, then you are all good to go ahead and appoint your friend or relative. But if any of your above answers is a yes, then you have to think this through carefully. An important point to take note is that for luxury real estate, you will need someone who is well-versed with the luxury market trends and ideally, has a good network of people who will either buy your property or at least know someone who might be interested to buy your place. Having the right skills is just as important. For landed properties, RES will have to deal with many technical questions. When the prospects start asking technical questions about building and construction guidelines or anything pertaining to renovation, construction costs or even road setback, it simply means that they are keen. Landing or losing that prospect will be determined if the answers are favourable to them. And this is why you must consider engaging a RES who is a specialist and not just a general practitioner. That makes the difference. When your mind is made up to hire the right person for the right job, how are you going to tell your friend or relative? A nice chat over a cup of coffee or a meal usually ends well. Explain to him or her that you value this relationship and it is better this way. You can even offer to buy through them the next property if that helps. If a friend truly cares, they will understand your good intention. If he or she feels sore about the sales commission, then that is also something to think about. Always remember, if you have a bad toothache, you need a dentist, not a heart surgeon or an eye specialist. So getting this right from the beginning, it will make your life easier and possibly save you a lot of money as well. We have heard of the saying, the more the merrier. But would this apply when appointing real estate salespeople or RES in short, to market your property. Recently, I saw a bungalow listed for sale on one of the real estate portals. What caught my eye was the fact that the same listing was advertised many times by different RES, easily more than a dozen of them who were trying to sell that same house. Out of curiosity, I randomly key in the mobile numbers of a few of the advertisers on the Council for Estate Agents website to understand their transaction track records. To my surprise, some of these advertisers have not even brokered one single landed property before. With a value of over $20 million for that particular house, I was very much puzzled by the decision-making process that the home sellers made given the fact that this is a high-value ticket item, wouldn't you be just as curious? So our third biggest mistake in today's video is using multiple RES to market your property, especially if you are the home seller of a landed property or a luxury real estate. Over the last three decades, 
I have met thousands of home sellers. More than 70% of them initially believe that getting more RES to market their property is better. They feel that their property will get more exposure. Thus, the possibility of landing the right buyer is higher. But after months of marketing, the whole process turned out to be a nightmare for them. And they shared these three common things. Firstly, many appointments were fixed and cancelled because it turned out to be the same prospect calling multiple RES to arrange. Secondly, some of the advertisements were quoting lower prices than others, which creates confusion and make the property look like a desperate or lay-long sale. Lastly, they were disappointed that there wasn't much feedback, although many viewings took place. These are just three of the common challenges that home sellers shared from their experience. Let me share with you another three of them. Number one, there are known cases whereby gung-ho buyers saw a property through RESA, but made multiple offers through RESA, RESB, RESC, or even RESD with the intent of getting the best deal for themselves. Being misled that there were multiple interested parties, the sellers increased their prices and ended up pricing themselves out of the market. So what happens in a declining real estate market whereby prices are falling every day? Time is your greatest enemy, which was quoted by Tom Cruise in the recent Top Gun movie. Every delay is costing them money. To make things worse, RESA might sue the home seller for the sales commission if he or she can prove that this particular buyer saw an offer through them in the first place. In case you are not aware, hijacking of home buyers is not something new. It has been happening for the longest time and importantly for you as a home seller, you do not want to end up having to pay both RES at the end of the day. Agree? Number two, for landed properties and luxury real estate, a totally different skill set is a must. What happens when a genuine and qualified buyer makes an inquiry through a competent RES? The answer is obvious. The chances of closing is high. But what happens when the same buyer makes an inquiry through a less competent RES? The home seller just missed the sale. By having more RES marketing their property, they are diluting the chances of finding the right buyer because genuine buyers who are ready to commit will just move on to look for something else when negotiation fails. They know that they are in a disadvantaged position to procrastinate on their buying decision if the market is on an upward trend. My third point to you as a home seller is this. When RES are competing among themselves to sell the same property, would their priority be to secure the highest possible price and the best terms for you or to close the sale as soon as possible? The theory is very simple. Most RES will not be committed to a prospect, be it a home buyer or seller, if the prospect is not committed to them. Just as in the example of marriages, commitment is important and takes effort, but will definitely go a long way for everyone. So, what should you do? There are three things that you can do to ensure you are engaging the right RES who can meet your needs and expectation. Number one, go out there and talk to some of them. Find out what they can do for you, but do not fall into the trap of engaging the RES who charges the lowest fee and I will share this with you in another one of our videos. Number two, check the RES record against the Council for Estate Agents website, which will show how many residential transactions they have successfully brokered in the past. Do note that CA's website will not capture transactions for commercial or industrial properties. Lastly, appoint the RES that you are most comfortable with after all the discussions you can list down the commitments they made in any one of the eight prescribed forms provided by the Council for Estate Agents. As a customer, 
you have every right to add in a clause to terminate the RES if he or she overcommits but underdelivers, or even they did not act in your best interest. At the end of the day, the more the merrier may not be what is best for you, as we have also heard of a common saying that too many cooks spoil the soup. Remember, what you need is an active RES who is skillful, well-versed and knowledgeable. Do you drive a car or perhaps ride a motorbike? If you do, you will notice that pump prices have been going up for quite a fair bit lately. Are you still going with your premium grade petrol with a higher octane level that costs more or have you decided to switch to something with a lower octane level but cost lesser? For those of you who do not drive, you may not be aware that the higher the octane level, it gives the car a better performance compared to those with a lower octane level. How does this even relate to today's topic? I will come to this in a short while. Choosing the Real Estate Salesperson or RES with the lowest fee. When it comes to engaging the services of RES, choosing the cheapest or the one with the lowest fee may not be good. In fact, this is a bad idea. We have heard of the saying, Pennywise Pound Foolish. And this is very true in this instance. But hang on, I'm not asking you to pay more unless you know what you're paying for and what you're getting in return. As a home seller, your three most important questions to ask the RES will be, number one, how much can I sell my property? Number two, what is your professional fee? And number three, what can you do for me to achieve the most for my property? The duration of the meeting between the homeowners and the RES greatly depends on which question is asked first. For example, if the first question asked is, how much is your professional fee? Because the seller wants to hire the cheapest RES, then the whole meeting can last less than 10 minutes. But if they ask the RES, what can you do to help me achieve the most for my property, then they might spend hours talking about details. Smart homeowners see value in engaging a good RES who can help them to achieve more for their property. They focus on the end results rather than their professional fee because they know that the money is well spent. However, there are also many homeowners who believe that simply placing an advertisement on property portals will generate a buyer for them. That may or may not be necessarily true. Let me explain why. I want you to imagine you are on a safari hunting trip. Do you just lay a trap and wait for the prey or do you jump onto a jeep and start hunting high and low for them? Laying a trap and waiting for the prey to come by seems like a very passive activity. You probably score better if you move around and hunt for them. When marketing a property, a good RES knows that more needs to be done. It is not as simple as putting up an online ad and waiting for the buyer to drop in. Going all the way out to find the buyers yield better results, although that might also mean incurring higher marketing costs. It is common practice for a good RES to invest in their marketing activities. He or she may engage a professional photographer to take better photos or even a videographer to create a virtual tour or a property tour. Some RES even invest in home staging to make the property more attractive. They may have the most beautiful photos or the most engaging video for the property. But if it is not reaching out to the right audience, it is as good as storing them in their hard drive. This is why experienced RES understand the importance of using digital marketing to reach out to a bigger audience. If you are familiar with social media marketing or search engine marketing, you will know that it can be very costly. What's my point? Let me draw you this triangle and show you three important things. On the top of the triangle is price, which refers to the sales price. 
On my right, we have speed, which refers to the time taken to find a buyer. And on my left, we have quality, which refers to the quality of the RES that you are engaging. If you must compromise, what are you willing to sacrifice? If you want speed, but unwilling to invest in quality, then you must compromise on the price. If you want a good price, but unwilling to invest in quality, then you must compromise on the speed. But if you want a good price, speed, and willing to invest in the quality to engage a specialist, everything seems to fall into place now and your objective will be met. Let me give you another example. If a person is unwell and needs an operation, will he ask for the best doctor who can assure him that the operation is going to be a success? Or will he ask for the cheapest doctor? What if he chooses the best doctor and he or she promise him that he will not charge a single cent if he's not cured? How does that sound? Pretty awesome, isn't it? Seems the doctor is very confident about what he or she is doing. Let me ask you this. How much do you need to pay your RES if he or she does not deliver the results you desire? Nothing. 0% of nothing equals to nothing. So do not make the mistakes of many others who chose the cheapest RES to market their property. Instead, choose the best. How do you do that? Go out there and speak to some of the RES. Get them to work out a customized marketing plan for you. One that breaks down the marketing costs. If it's worthwhile, just do it. Stop focusing on the cost to engage a good RES and start working towards achieving a good price for your property. This, my friend, is the big picture. You may have heard about the JAM experiment, which was an experiment conducted in the year 2000. For those of you who have not heard about this, you might wonder, what is the JAM experiment all about? Well, the experiment shows evidence about the adverse effects of choice, and the subject was fruit jam. Researchers found that more people purchased jam from a particular store when fewer options were available. The famous American psychologist Barry Watts shared about the psychology behind the paradox of choice, which will create three things. Number one, analysis paralysis. The more choices can often lead to a worse user experience. Number two, buyer's remorse. That the more choices you have, the worse you will feel after you buy the product. Why? Because your standards have been raised and now all you can think about is how much better the other option might have been. And number three, ego depletion, which is a real thing. Willpower is a finite resource. The more decision we must make in a day, the faster we drain that resource. And this brings us to mistake number five, choosing the real estate salesperson or RES in short with the most listing. Earlier, I shared about the paradox of choice. Can you imagine a RES presenting 20 to 30 listings to you even before you have time to digest the first few that you have seen? Home buyers will get confused as every property has something but not everything they like. Even their must-have and good-to-have requirements are all jumbled up. According to Harvard professor Jared Zetman, 95% of purchasing decisions are subconscious because we buy based on emotion. Therefore, the way that many people think, feel, often contradicts with what they say. Think about this. For a RES who is already overloaded with too many listings, what are the chances that your property will still be getting their full attention? If you are a parent, ask yourself, is it easier to take care of just one child or four children? I'm a father of four, and I know it's not easy to give equal attention to all my children unless I can split myself into four different places at any point in time, which we know is not possible. With so many unsold listings on hand, it is natural that most RES will selectively push certain listings for various reasons. It could be the price is more realistic, the seller is paying more commission, or the property is in high demand but limited supply. 
If yours is none of the above, I suspect you are nowhere near the top priority list. So what should you do? Oh, by the way, most home sellers feel that their property is the best and start asking for very high prices. Whether it's true or not, do your homework and price it right. Instead of engaging the RES with the most listings, you will need one who is dedicated, active, as well as familiar with the transactions in your neighborhood. Not only that, he or she should ideally have a fair share of transactions for properties similar to what you are looking to sell. A RES with 100 rental transactions every year but has not done a single sale is not going to be of much help to home sellers, especially if theirs is a luxury real estate or a landed property. I have emphasized this many times because this is very important. Secondly, there is no cookie cutter approach to selling properties. All properties are unique in some way. Identify your selling points as well as your challenges that you might face. Discuss with your RES. If you are working with a good RES, he or she will know how to handle those objections when the buyers raise them. Another important thing to take note of is the competition in your neighborhood. If a better listing is selling for a lesser price than yours, it is only logical that the unit will go first. You might be next, provided there is no other better listings asking for lower price. If one of your neighbors is in a financial situation and price their property very competitively, what would you do? Do you lower your price or do you wait for them to sell first? These are things to think about. The truth is, anyone can promise you that they will do their best to find you that one right buyer who's willing to offer the best price. But no one can promise you that there will be no other competitors. When you engage the services of a RES or even a specialist who's familiar with your neighborhood, your chances of finding the right buyer will be higher. You do not need a RES with the most listings, but you will need to get the right person for the right job. Get this right, because mistakes in real estate transactions are always costly. And the truth about making mistakes, you'll never know it until it's too late. Have you ever asked yourself how long it takes to make a mistake? Or when do you know that you make a mistake and if that mistake could have been prevented in the first place? We may not have all the answers, but one thing for sure, no one likes to make mistakes, especially if they are costly. In today's video, I'll be talking about wrong pricing strategy. To begin with, let me ask you this question. What is the highest positive intention of a home seller? That is a no-brainer, isn't it? I'm sure you already know that every home seller wants to sell as high as possible. But guess who's sitting on the opposite side of the table? Their prospective buyers. And what is their highest positive intention? That's right, to knock down the seller's price as low as they can. So what do most home sellers do? They start by asking very high prices for their property. While some of them did this deliberately, there are also others who are simply ignorant of the risk. Unlike 30 years ago, when I first joined the real estate industry and sales transactions are less easily available, an unscrupulous real estate salesperson, or RES in short, can simply point to any property that was recently sold and tell the buyer it was sold at X dollars and that the buyer should buy the listing that he or she is marketing for X dollars as well. These days, transactions data are more transparent and easily available. Buyers have also become more sophisticated. And not only that, banks are also offering free indicative valuation for them. Three things will happen when home sellers apply the wrong pricing strategy. Number one, if they underprice their property, it will be gone too soon before they even realize what they did wrong. Some of these home sellers may not even realize their mistake if their decision is based on friends' advice, friends who may or may not be their RES. Point number two, if the home sellers overprice their property, they are helping their neighbors who are also trying to sell theirs. Buyers compare prices 
and especially if the units for sale are somewhat similar to each other. Naturally, the one with the lower asking price seems to be a better buy. And point number three, overpriced listings have a negative impact if it remains unsold for a long time. This is what we call stale listings. And the owners of stale listings could have missed a lot of potential buyers if the market is bullish. But things may change if there's a sudden change and cooling measures are introduced. By the way, I hope you notice when such cooling measures are announced and how soon it takes effect. In most cases, everyone is caught by surprise. Many home sellers I met shared this with me. They will say something like, Hey Alex, we are in no urgency to sell our property. Let's start with X dollar. And if we do not get what we want after a while, we will adjust the price accordingly. Now, it could be weeks, months, or even years for some home sellers to come to their senses. Some even made the mistake of adjusting their prices several times. And three things could possibly happen. Number one, they missed the boat. The group of highly motivated buyers who expressed interest to buy their property are no longer there. They ended up with new buyers who have not seen enough listings to make a decision. Number two, active buyers who are monitoring the market will notice the prices being adjusted down. If this is done more than once, the signal to this group of savvy buyers is to wait since the sellers are still adjusting their price down and it seems to them that the seller has no interested parties for their property. And number three, what about those genuine buyers who are ready to buy? They started searching months ago and saw the same property again after much later. And it's still available. Most of them will have this thought. If that property is good, why are there no takers? They are left wondering if there's something wrong they do not know. Thus, they are very careful and doubtful even if they like that particular property. For sellers who missed many good offers, it is common that they subsequently ended up selling lower than what was previously offered to them, especially in a declining market. You can ask me about this when we have a chance to meet. I have many case studies to prove this to you. So the question is, how can you prevent over or underpricing your own property? Let's face it, every home seller will feel that their property is better than their neighbor who is also trying to sell. But let me ask you this question, who determines the market? Is it the buyers or the sellers? Sellers tend to compare with what is for sale and buyers, what has been sold. No one knows how long a unit has been trying to sell or how many rounds of price adjustments it has been made unless they monitor the market every day. But for units that are sold, it's a clear indication what is acceptable by the market. Okay, I hear you. You really feel that your property is better and deserves a premium. I totally agree that some properties command a premium, but the question is, how much? None of us can exactly put a percentage or dollar value as everyone has a different perspective. One may put a premium on a high floor unit, while another may prefer a low floor unit for several reasons. I believe it is fair to price yourself higher than the last sale in an uprising market, but do it within a reasonable range. If you ask for too much and receive no inquiries, no viewers or no other offers, you may wonder why, but I'm not surprised. You can talk to some of the RES and better still, to a specialist they will have the facts and statistics to guide you on this. I will share with you another tip. This is one of the most accurate methods that you can use to gauge the selling price for your property. And you will be hearing from a professional instead of a RES. Approach a mortgage banker on the pretext of buying a property. Describe your property to them, but please do not tell them you are the owner. Give the most accurate description and get the mortgage broker to check with their valuers for an indicative value. A genuine buyer who wants to buy your property will probably do the same. And the good thing is, mortgage bankers are neutral parties, unlike some unscrupulous RES who may advise you to price your property lower. 
just to make their job easier. This is a very relevant concern for many home sellers. Have you been to a supermarket? Which outlet or brand do you like the most? I am sure you have your favourite choice and it may not just be the pricing or the location. You could be attracted to the neatness and cleanliness of the place. Some of us do not even mind if the prices are slightly higher. Why is this so? This has to do with our five senses. A supermarket which is neat and clean is visually pleasing to our eyes. The soft music at the background makes our whole shopping experience relaxing. The smell of the bakery or the roll station can whet our appetite. In the supermarket, we can also get to feel or even give a gentle squeeze to our favourite loaf of bread to ensure it is soft and fresh before putting into our shopping trolley. We can even sample some of the products if there is a promoter. We use all our five senses in the supermarket. But when it comes to buying a property, we do not use all of them. But the sense of sight and smell is extremely important. We are talking about poor viewing experience. We know that first impression matters. But the truth is, many a time, this has been overlooked by home sellers. Can you imagine walking into a property that is a mess? The place is cluttered with things everywhere and to make things worse, it smells horrible. Either someone has left dirty laundry lying around or they could have forgotten to flush the toilet bowl. A cluttered house makes the actual property look smaller because our eyes are playing tricks on us and our subconscious mind is telling us, this is smaller than I thought. I know many real estate salespeople will prep the prospects beforehand and tell them to visualize an empty house. But most people cannot visualize something else in their mind when they are looking at the actual thing. So what can you as a home seller do to make the viewing experience more pleasant for the prospective buyers? Here are three things that you can consider. Number one, you have to declutter. I spoke with some self-confessed hoarders. They shared that they do not really need most of the things they collected over the years. It can be anything from old newspapers, books, empty shoe boxes, or even that old broken television which has been replaced more than 10 years back. Here's my point. When the property is sold, they have to declutter and throw away all unwanted items anyway. And they might as well do it now before putting the property up for sale. I have this hanging in my office. It says, don't say you don't have enough time. You have the same exact number of hours per day as Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. So if you want to create a better experience for your prospective buyers and secure a better price for yourself, set a date to declutter your house. Do it now. As the saying goes, procrastination is a disease. Point number two, you must make your place smell amazing. You are going to pamper the prospect's sense of smell and you do not need to spend a lot of money or hassle to get this done. Just go to the supermarket and buy a packet of frozen croissant. That should cost you less than $10 for 6 to 8 pieces. Whenever you have any house viewing, toss one of the croissants into the oven at 350 degrees for 15 minutes. Do this before your viewers arrive and they will be greeted with the most inviting fragrance. What can you do if for some reason you are unable to declutter and you know that baking a frozen croissant isn't going to help. Then my third and final point is to engage a service provider to conceptualize an artist's impression for your property provided it does not cause you an arm or a leg. For apartments and condo, engaging an interior designer will do the trick. But for all landed properties, you may need to engage an architect. For one of my recent projects that was sold, I advise my seller to invest some money to engage a world-renowned architect to do a concept design for his old bungalow. You might think, wow, that must have cost a lot of money. But not really. For the value of more than $10 million, it is worth every single cent. The property was sold much higher than any other offers we have received in the past. Earlier, 
I shared that not many people are good at visualizing images mentally. And what I have just done was simply shifting their focus. Now, they do not see the property as what it is, but rather what it can be. With the artist's impression and floor plans nicely printed onto a brochure that they can physically hold on to, their dream became a reality when they can see better. That wasn't too hard, was it? But before jumping in to engage an interior designer or an architect, you need to know what are the things that home buyers desire to have in their dream home. Getting the design and concept right is very important. And again, I need to emphasize this. For luxury real estate or landed properties, please talk to a specialist. Not anyone with little or zero knowledge for your property. You need to get the right person for the right job. You do not want to burn your hard-earned money unnecessarily. And doing this right can help you secure a better price and also going to make your life a whole lot easier. When we were young, our parents tend to tell us what to do or even what to say. But as we grew older and have a mind on our own, we dislike being told what to do, especially if it is something that we know better. Don't you think it is odd if the patient is the one that's telling the doctor what to do? Or perhaps the client telling their lawyer what he or she should do to win a court case? You will agree that this is very odd. But when it comes to appointing a real estate salesperson or RES for their property, many home sellers make this mistake. They breathe down on the RES neck and treat them like a child, telling them they should do this and they should do that. When that happens, the outcome usually does not turn out well, especially when it comes to dealing with a professional who knows their job well. Today's mistake number eight is about home sellers who are micromanaging the sales process. In my last 30 years in the real estate business, I have met thousands of home buyers and sellers. While some may value with what I share with them, others have a mind of their own. There are home sellers who insist on micromanaging the sales process. They want to be involved with everything from writing their own advertisements, what to say during the house tour, or even walk with the home buyers during the viewing. They must approve the choice of words and photos used for their advertisement. While their intent may be good, it can be frustrating for RES who have a lot of brilliant ideas what to do or know what is best for the home seller. Many years ago, a home seller picked on my advertisement without understanding my good intention. He mentioned that I missed out many things in my advertisement description. He also wanted me to include a photo of every corner of his property. It does not serve any purpose to argue with stubborn homeowners. Arguing with them is a bad idea. And you know what happened when a salesperson wins an argument with a high ego customer. The salesperson is not actually winning anything. Agree? So, why did I miss out some info in my ad copies? Was I sloppy or were there some other reasons for that? The truth is, I deliberately left out some information so that genuine buyers will have to contact me to find out more. If my ad states everything, prospects will not call because they assume they know enough to form a judgment that the property is not suitable for them. Think about this. Can the sale be done when the prospects are not responding to the advertiser? Remember, telling is not selling. Anyone can tell a story but a good storyteller knows what to say, when to say, and how to say so that the audience is constantly kept in suspense. Likewise, good salesmanship requires the same skills and that, my friend, is a skill that takes years of practice. Let's analyze this. Is there something wrong if a home seller appoints a RES and at the same time has to tell the RES what to do? The seller seem to have doubts about the RES capabilities. Yes? Then why even engage the RES in the first place? What are other examples of home sellers micromanaging the sales process? I know there are home sellers who follow the RES and the prospects around during the viewings. Some even try to present the property themselves because 
they believe they know better about their property, which I'm sure, but do they know enough about the prospect or the market sentiments? Their good intention may end up in a disaster for themselves. Here are three potential risks for home sellers who micromanage. Number one, the RES abilities will be limited, not by what he cannot do, but rather by what he is restricted to do and may end up being a yes man instead of putting his best effort to go all the way out to find the right buyer for the seller. Number two, most buyers are not comfortable with sellers tagging around during the property presentation by the RES. I have encountered sellers who disrupted the RES presentation and asked the buyers sensitive questions. You can imagine how uncomfortable it must have been for the buyers. Point three, sellers may unknowingly disclose certain information that reveal they have no offer or low offer on hand, or worse still, say something that contradicts with their RES. When that happens, it creates uh. doubts for the prospects that either the home seller or their RES is not telling the truth. As a home seller, you do not want that to happen. So what's my advice for today? Look at the big picture. What is the result that you want to achieve? Hmm, let me think. A sale done at a good price, isn't it? If this is the common objective between you and the RES, then you must learn to trust the RES. And I'm not saying that you must trust them blindly, but rather trust them after you are assured that he or she is the right person or the best person to serve your needs. You can encourage them to elaborate more about their marketing plans for your property. When there are doubts, do not reject any idea immediately. Instead, ask for clarity. The truth is, any good RES will be more than willing to share if the discussion is not stressful. If it gets too stressful, the chances of the RES making empty promises to please the seller is high. But when it comes to delivering those commitments, that is another thing. Lack of communication between the home sellers and their RES is bad. This will create misunderstandings. When an RES is working on the sale of a property half-heartedly, we know what is going to happen. They will not perform at their best and may just want to wrap things up as quickly as they can. In communication, the one asking the question is the one who's receiving new information. That's why we are often told to listen more than we talk. So go ahead and ask your RES as many questions as you want. After all, you are paying for their professional advice. Unless you are looking to engage a yes man, otherwise refrain from telling them what to do. Like it or not, professionals have knowledge, skills, pride and expertise to achieve or surpass your expectations. The famous Greek philosopher Socrates quoted this, Without rules, we are nothing but animals. And Singapore has so many rules that people often joke that we are a fine city. And I'm sure you couldn't agree more. Jokes aside, let me ask you this. Will you remember all the rules that were set by the government if they did not list it down or make them enforceable? I'm sure you know the answer, don't you? In today's video, we'll be sharing with you the ninth biggest mistakes home sellers make, which is failure to keep proper documentation. If you want to check out our earlier videos, you can find them on our Facebook page or YouTube channel. Or if you prefer to make your life easier, just click the follow us button on our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, turn on the notification, and you'll never ever miss any of our videos again. So if you are ready, let's get started with mistake number nine, failure to keep proper documentation. I know many people who hate paperwork, but if it saves us from getting into a lot of trouble, why not? Do you know what the real estate industry was like when it was not regulated by the government before 2010? Some of you may remember that the real estate industry was also called a cowboy industry for many reasons which I shall not elaborate. Those days, the consumers were always at the losing end until the Ministry of National Development stepped in to establish the Council for Estate Agents or CEA on 22nd October 2010 with the goal to regulate and develop the real estate industry in Singapore. 
When I sat on CA's committee for the formation of the Professional Service Manual, or PSM in 2011, many issues and bad practices were brought up. Some of these includes misrepresentation, unethical advertising, under-table money or kickback, fraudulent transactions, or even failure to exercise fiduciary duties to their client. In their relentless effort to clean up the real estate industry, CEA implemented new rules and practice guidelines to ensure that real estate salespeople, or RES in short, will carry out their business in a proper manner. Not only that, but they also make it mandatory for RES to attend Continuing Professional Development, or CPD, every year. The CPD scheme requires RES to upgrade themselves and keep abreast of the latest changes in policies and procedures relating to real estate transactions. In recent years, more policies were implemented, including the reporting of suspicious transactions and conducting checks for parties involved in a transaction. CEA also introduced eight prescribed forms to be used when engaging the services of RES, regardless they are looking to buy, sell or lease residential properties in Singapore. But here's the challenge. Many members of the public were not aware of this. Many a time I hear from my colleagues that home sellers refuse to acknowledge the CEA's prescribed form. Their customers share that they have dealt with other RES and none of them mention anything about paperwork. They become Aww. confused about the need for proper documentation because they were uninformed and misinformed. When it comes to real estate related matters, many friends and relatives who are not in this practice will try to give you all sorts of advice. I do not want to question their intention, but please be careful because they may not be an expert in this area. But I'm sure they meant well. Just as the saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Thus, using your judgement could be a better option. I have also come across home sellers who were ignorant and simply refused to acknowledge any paperwork. Luckily for me, I'm always prepared and equipped myself with copies of CEA's public notice. After I shared and explained to them, they finally understood that this documentation protects them. For home sellers, here are five points that must be clearly stated in the CEA Form 1 for non-exclusive agreement or Form 5 for exclusive agreement when engaging a RES for the sale of a property. Point 1. What is the expected sales price? This is quite straightforward, although it is not cast in stone. We know that Singapore's property market is either on an upward trend or a downward trend most of the time. It rarely stays stagnant. Point 2. How long is the appointment period? For an exclusive appointment, this can be anything up to three calendar months. If the appointed RES is doing a good job, but not getting the right buyer yet, do consider a three months renewal. This, by the way, is legit and the option to renew is stated on page 1 in your CEA Form 5. Point 3. How much is the service fee and whether GST is applicable? Do not make the mistake of engaging the RES with the lowest fee if he or she is not capable of meeting your needs. This was something I shared in my video for mistake number 4. Remember, if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. Point 4. Does the RES has a conflict of interest? If your RES is going to buy your property, or the potential buyer is somehow related, the RES must make a declaration. There have been past cases whereby the sellers found out that the buyer for their property is the spouse or relative of the RES. They were concerned whether the RES put in his or her best effort to negotiate the best price and terms for them. Somehow it does not feel good for home sellers who were caught in this situation. Final point. Is your appointed RES going to co-broke with other RES who may have buyers for your property? This is quite straightforward and I will not elaborate further on this. For other terms and conditions that were discussed and agreed upon by both parties, you can also include them in the prescribed forms. With all this in place, you are good to go ahead. When everything goes smoothly, your next call will probably be to the movers. Agreed? Okay, I want you to think of three words and tell me which do you feel most or least associated with. Ready? Number one, property. Number two, home. And number three, family. 
Now I'm going to make a wild guess and suspect you'll be most associated with number one family, followed by home, and finally property. The truth is, our family and loved ones are the people who make a property into a home. After all, a house is built with bricks and beams. A home is built with love and dreams. But when it comes to selling their property, many home sellers make this 10th biggest mistakes and we shall find out what it is in a short while. Today, I'll be sharing with you the final mistake which is having emotional attachment to their property. Do you remember the movie Up which was produced by Pixar Animation Studios and released by Walt Disney Pictures in 2009? It shares the story of a young boy who fell in love, got married, bought a property and the couple saved as much as they can to fulfill their dream to travel around the world. Sadly, the couple grew old and the wife fell sick and eventually passed away without fulfilling their dreams. Then came the real estate developers knocking on his door, but the elderly man simply refused to sell his house even though it was already surrounded by many new constructions. Then tying balloons to his house, he decided to travel around the world in his house which was lifted up into the air. There was a young scout who unknowingly got dragged along and both had quite an adventure. But the elderly man finally learned how to let go of things. Although this is just a movie, it is a clear example of many home sellers who share a certain emotion attachment to their property. And let me explain why this is bad. The house selling process itself can be unpredictable and emotional roller coaster. When prospective buyers see a property they like, not everyone will express their interest upfront or offer the best price. They may criticize the property being old, the outdated renovation, or even pick on the nitty gritty imperfection of the property. All this just for one intention, to bring the price down. Every action has a reaction and upon hearing these negative remarks, suddenly the home seller heard a voice telling them, don't sell to this buyer. That voice is not from me, not from their family member or their real estate agent. Whose voice do you think it was? One thing for sure, an angry mind is a narrow mind. The home seller may not be in the right state of mind to make a good decision even if the buyer put in a good offer on the table. Here's the hard truth. Although the seller is upset, it is still better than having prospective buyers walking in and out of their property, smiling from cheek to cheek without a single comment or a single offer. Agree? Let's face it, selling a property can be a bittersweet experience if the seller is upgrading to a larger home or moving to a better place. The same process can also be stressful if he or she is grieving a major life change or downsizing. Home sellers are very likely to make these three mistakes if they are emotionally attached to their property. Number one, wrong pricing. A property which has full of memories may have a high value to the seller. He may want to set a high price for that. But remember, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. For the buyer, there are no fond memories of the property. An overpriced property is not something that appeals to them or anyone in the first place. Number two, poor decision making. The buyer's objective is to knock the seller's price as low as they can. Are the sellers prepared to hear some feedback that may not sound like music to them? Making any decision when a person is emotionally unstable is bad. I know someone who was dumped by his girlfriend and out of devastation, he said yes to marrying another girl he barely knew. You can already figure out the outcome, can't you? Number three, mental health. Being indecisive when making a big decision in life will take a toll on your mental health and possibly the people around you. You will risk souring the relationship with your family and loved ones when things get too stressful in the house. So what's my advice for today? Here are three things you can do. Number one, be mentally prepared. Know what to expect. Remind yourself to stay calm when insensitive buyers visit your property and make negative remarks. If it helps, go out of the house whenever you have any house viewing unless you are a control freak who simply loves to micromanage. Why bother to hang around? In fact, home buyers will be more relaxed and take their time to closely inspect the property 
when the owner is not around. So just leave the house for a while and do something that makes you happy. Number two, be decisive. To make a good and considered decision, you need to know what is your desired outcome. Start by considering what is your goal. In this instance, set a realistic price and when you achieve it, let it go. It does not matter if the right offer comes too fast because buyers who have seen enough know what to offer. On the contrary, home sellers who have not had enough prospects viewing their property are the ones who are indecisive. Number three, move on after the property is sold. Taking two steps forward and three steps backward is not going to make anything easier for home sellers. There was this incident that happened to me around 2014 after the additional buyer stamp duties was first introduced in 2013. If you can remember, the property market stayed cold for quite a while. A home seller contacted me, complaining that he has been desperately trying to sell his house for more than a year. He had many real estate agents working on the property, but none brought anything close to what he wanted. I happened to be serving a prospect who was actively house hunting after having sold her property. She was happy with what she saw and bought the property at a price which was slightly higher than the seller's reserve price. Sounds like a happy ending, doesn't it? But about two years later, I ran into the seller at a supermarket. Guess what? He commented that I did not give him my best advice back then as the property market has improved and his property is worth a lot more. That year was 2016, but that home seller was still stuck in 2014. Remember, every decision that we make at a certain point in time is the best decision at that point in time. Things change over time and there's no point harping about the past. One thing for sure, we cannot change the past, but we can make the future better if we choose to. Don't you agree? Okay, we have come to the end of this 10-part video series. Watch out for more videos coming up on our channel. Remember to click the follow us button on our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you have not done so. If you have any questions about buying, selling or investing in a property, you can always reach out to us at 9780-0000. As promised, we will only share our unbiased opinion. This is Alex Chua from Home of the Elite signing off. Until we meet again, you stay safe for now.